Hello, my name is Tom Heller. In the next lecture, I would like to give you an introduction into ultrasound findings in HIV-infected patients. I'm trained in internal medicine and infectious disease, and as you might guess from the accent in German, and had I stayed in working in Germany, I think I would not be able to show you all these this slides and pictures because simply the number of um, HIV patients in, in Germany is too low had the chance to work for a while in South Africa. So that's where most of these images and findings were from. Everybody knows South Africa. There's the beautiful city of Cape Town, close to Falls Bay in the Atlantic. Beautiful, very scenic. And behind that, the, um, the, the wine, growing, wine growing areas, all well known, very touristy. We all these are localized here in the Western Cape region. We have been based in the in on the other side on the east coast in KwaZulu Natal, which is also a very nice area known for bird, bush, and beach, as the tourist board um, puts it. So that's the Drakensberg area, which is alpine, very very nice area. The beaches, of course, very long, very lonely, and the bush with all its wildlife, which you can enjoy from very close. And of course, this is a very interesting site. Unfortunately, this is not the sites that they pay you to go for to another country. That's the ones that you pay for. So why we were sent to um, South Africa becomes more clear from this map, with my, I was there with my wife with a German development aid agency in an HIV and TB program. And as you can see, South Africa is one of the red countries here. So it is one of the um, highly affected countries with a very high prevalence of people living with HIV. And um, if you look within South Africa, then this, this eastern parts here have an even higher rate than the rest of the country. So we worked in this health district, in the Schlavisa Hospital Health District, um, that's actually basically it has a, a small district hospital, has then 14 clinics in its area. There is one major road passing through, and that's here down here where most of the people live and where also we lived in Matuba Tuba. Tuba Tuba is almost a city, had a petrol station, a spa, so you had... It, you can say it is a, oh, a village. Then, but if you leave Matuba Tuba, then it becomes quickly this type of housing, which the epidemiologists would call a semi-rural areas. And if you drive a little bit further, quickly you are into real rural areas with traditional housing and with, without tarmac on the streets. So that's that's it is really a little bit of a remote area. Here another house in the area of the hospital. Within the area is also the Africa Center for Health and Population Studies, where my wife used to work. And they do, beside many other interesting studies, they do an HIV household survey, which gives them a very good information on a population base, how many patients are infected with HIV. And these are the type of figures that they produce. And they are actually Unimpressive or quite boring, but they are, if you look what they mean, then they are really frightening because this is the HIV prevalence on the population. And if you see the 30, here, the 30 to 34 year old women in red, 50 is above 50%. So more than every second woman at that stage was HIV positive. Men are a little bit less, but not really significant and are a little bit later. But in general, it is an area of a very, with a very, very high HIV prevalence. So, as I mentioned, we used to live in Matuba Tuba, the hospital, which I worked three days a week. Two days I worked here in a clinic, three days in Schlabisa Hospital. This is the way to the hospital. And this passes through a game park area, which is, of course, a very nice. You can have some game watching in the morning. And it is not that um, there are no traffic jams there. It is that you can find traffic jams in the park, but obviously the traffic jams might have a little bit of a different reason. There are elephants blocking the streets, and it is well accepted to come a little bit late with the excuse, well, elephants blocked the road. 
But then when you make it to Slabisa Hospital, that is the entrance. And before we enter, I would like to mention two, I think, very good articles. One from Enrico Brunetti on the current role on abdominal ultrasound in the clinical management of patients with HIV. It's already a few years old. And also from Kavoya, abdominal ultrasound findings in HIV patients, a pictorial review. If you have queries, then these are both very good articles that give you a summary on basically on what I say now also. And some of the pictures that I took are taken from Enrico's article as well. So let's quickly recapitulate. HIV complications depend on disease status. I think everybody of you knows that. The CD4 count determines the amount of immunosuppression. And let's say above 500, we have less opportunistic infections, maybe persist in generalized lymphadenopathy. When the CD4 count drops below 500, pulmonary TB becomes more frequent. And also Kaposi, Sarcom, Hodgkin's lymphoma, when we drop below 200, the immunosuppression becomes more severe and we have pneumocystis, Carini, extrapulmonary TB, below 100, then toxoplasmosis, cryptococcosis, meningitis, very common in South Africa, and other diseases, and below 50 disseminated cytomegalovirus infections might be to of mention. So this we have to have back of our head when we scan patients, because we have obviously to interpret the lesions in the light of their status of immune suppression. If you look at ultrasound in AIDS patient in Africa in the literature, then there was relatively little until recently. It picked up a little bit more. There is one big study in, um, from, from Congo and Zambia. And there the, the, the researchers scanned altogether 900 patients, which is quite an impressive number, and compared it to 900 not HIV-infected controls. Well, there was a bit of an indication, so it wasn't random people. Scanned and what they found is that HIV patients had more frequent splenomegaly, more frequent hepatomegaly, lymphadenopathy more common, biliary tract abnormalities more frequent, gut wall thickening, and ascites more common. And then renal involvement, renal abnormalities, they only found in 11% of the patients. That's something I find a little bit low. And I'll show you some examples later. But in general, this gives you an idea where we want to look for in HIV patients. So let's start with the liver. The size of the liver is increased in a large number of HIV patients. The trouble is how to measure the size of the liver. That is a bit subjective. Always depends where you measure and how you measure. So I don't find it very helpful. Positive infections of diffuse augmented liver size, CMV, atypical mycobacteria, hepatitis, of course, common co-infections, hepatitis B and C malignant lymphoma, and then TB, granulomatose hepatitis. Easier to identify because they're just different than, than the rest of the liver, are focal lesions of the liver. In HIV patients, we have basically, well, as always, we have three types. We have areas which are less echogenic, hypoechoic than the normal liver. This might be suggesting infiltration of lymphoma. That is an example here. Um, tuberculosis or abscesses, bacterial or fungal abscesses. Then we have lesions of mixed echogenicity and partly hyperechoic, which are suggestive of Kaposi sarcoma. And then we have only hyperechoic, which might suggest Mycobacterium avium complex, Bartonella henselet, sopeliosis in infection, CMV, pneumocystis carini. Here's an example from Zimbabwe, and you can see this um, is a liver. And you can see there are, like in a Swiss cheese, there are lots of hypoechoic, almost anechoic lesions within it. And what, what is striking, what you can see is that these lesions seem to almost follow the, the vessels, encasing the vessels. It's not a diffuse distribution of focal lesions, but it seems to have a pattern following the liver. So that, that is suggestive of periportal lymphoma infiltration. So some forms of lymphoma do that. Obviously, they can also diffusely distribute focal lesions. But this is in particular is a case of a periportal lymphoma and was confirmed by biopsy.
there are other focal lesions like these ones here that have these bull's eyes appearance also yeah in hiv infected immunosuppressed patients then next we have the more echogenic ones as you can see here these were these were areas infiltrated by kaposi sarcoma a vascular surface rich tumor pneumocystis carini involvement of the liver here with these multiple small echogenic lesions the biliary system is also affected in hiv the biliary system is, is one of the most difficult areas to scan so i think it's not very fruitful for the beginner to look at that area but it has some infections in hiv patients particularly cryptosporidium and, and cmv infections that affect the biliary tree it causes an dilatation of irregular and especially a concentric thickening of the peribiliary connective tissue. Also, the gallbladder wall might be thicker, suggesting cholecystitis, but cholecystitis in the absence of a stone is in an immune competent patient. It's very rare. In an HIV patient, it is possible. Then, obviously, it is an infective process and not so much a process caused by a stone. If you look at the literature, you will find that the AIDS-related sclerosing cholangitis is graded in, into four types depending on where the where the main problem lies. I have to admit that I, I never had much benefit from looking at that and I, I must say that it doesn't really change neither treatment nor further diagnostics. So it is, I think, something I want to mention it, but it is not, not that important. So let's look at a, a case of a patient from South Africa with a upper right uh, right upper quadrant pain icteric and what we see is this is this increased echogenic material around the bile duct here you can see it's like a like a shotgun too this is the, the lower one is the portal the upper one is the bile duct and and also intrahepatic there there is simply too much echogenic material around around the the bile duct the next example this might even be a bit more obvious almost like fibrotic echogenic material and in this case also the common bile duct here is dilated it's larger than than eight millimeters nine millimeters and of course this combined with appropriate clinical upper quadrant pain and lab findings suggests cholangia here we have a case of a cholecystitis this is the liver relatively normal and here you can see this for this gallbladder without stones, the wall thick, and here's some edema, especially in the upper part. That is a case of acarculose cholecystite. Looking at the spleen, there is also, as, as we remember maybe from the study from Cong Congo and Zambia, splenomegaly is a frequent finding in, in, a, in a variety of generalized infections. Focal infections are possible. Focal hypoechoic lesions might be due to abscesses, TB abscesses. We will look at that in more detail in another lecture. And lymphoma can also affect the spleen, similar to the liver. Let's have a look at this little clip from a patient from Lavisa. There is also, this is the spleen. And we will quickly see a focal lesion. There it is. He's in size. What does that look like well yes it looks like a wheel in wheel or a um, wheel in wheel appearance so that suggests candida well i assume it was it was candida he treated with fluconazole and this lesion disappeared which was quite good to differentiate because the, this patient was suffering from severe um, immunosuppression and severe kaposi sarcoma um, and so there there was this is the legs and the infiltrated genital um, so this is this was a severely immunocompromised patients and the on fluconazole this lesion disappeared all other lesions toxoplasmosis we have this um, calcifications with the dorsal acoustic shadow and then snowstorm pattern and then multiple echogenic areas in the spleen it's a very descriptive well snowstorm or a starry sky whatever you prefer it's not really 
pathognomonic for for anything. And, and initially, it was thought that it would be only pneumocystis, but in the meantime, it has it has been seen in, in, in diffuse candida infections and aspergillus infections. And I think this publication here is is a very good one. They they did um, even histology studies on this. They realized that these these echogenic areas they are not calcified in that sense. So it's not calcifications that we're looking at. Their explanation is that the multiple interfaces due to fibrosis cause these echogenic dots, and that the num a number of these cause then the snowstorm appearance. So let's have a look: snowstorm or starry sky, whatever you will. This is again a patient from Pariren Yatba Hospital in Zimbabwe, which we scanned in 2000. And you can see an enlarged spleen, and it has this multiple uh, echogenic reflexes. What's the cause? I cannot tell you. Well, maybe it's it's a pneumocyst, is maybe something else. It was not. Um, I we we did not get any any result here. It's just a, the, the another patient. Can't really say what what was the cause of this. We see multiple echogenic foci, possibly due to pneumocystis. Pathology of the kidneys. Initially, I said already that I wasn't quite uh, quite happy with what the the study found that only this only minimal increase in in renal pathology because I think it is it is what is quite common is this focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. It is usually, it shows itself as a maybe normal or minimally increased size kidneys, but a very hyperechoic parenchyma, the, the biggest finding this hyperechoic parenchyma. The final diagnosis, of course, can only be made by ultrasound guided puncture, but it is not, um, it doesn't affect your treatment. So in a resource limited setting, obviously this will not be necessarily an, a, a first thing to look for to get a kidney biopsy done. Then there is a few other reasons in HIV patients for nephrocalcinosis. Um, one is um, local calcium deposition due to infections. And again, this has no clinical relevance. It's more of an, a finding. This is a typical picture of a HIV kidney in a young patient. You see, if you compare, this is the liver, this is the kidney. You can see that the kidney is more echogenic than the liver, and it is a little bit it, it's swollen almost. It can be that the kidney becomes bright. This is a HIV patient in Slavisa, a very bright and then shiny kidney here again. And this is the, the transverse axis next to the liver, it's almost bright as a light. And if we look at this in motion picture, then you can see maybe better. So this is the, the kidney, liver. And then uh, let's come back to the kidney here. You can see there's echo, there's this hypoechoic areas, and then the cortex itself is very echogenic. Obviously, the the um, the hyper the e less echogenic areas. These are the py pyramids. They have the tubuli, and as it is a glomerulonephritis, this affects, of course, mainly the area where the glomeruli are, so the cortex. So in comparison. The, um, the pyramids appear less echogenic. Another case, and again, the same is true. See this echogenic, echogenic cortex, this more hypoechoic pyramids. I'm pointing at that now. And then you can see that there is additionally, there is some um, dilatation of the, of the ureter. So that is, um, that is additionally, it's not only a HIV nephropathy, but it is additionally a urinary tract obstruction present. This was due to lymph nodes further down the, the course of the urine. Then some others which I just want to mention, of course, because they are not so much into this lecture and cardiac involvement. You have frequently have um, pericarditis, TB pericarditis, tamponade. HIV cardiomyopathy is a big problem, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension. Then we have effusions, plural effusions, and pneumonia, which we can also see in ultrasound, and intra-abdominal bleeding. We have to remember that um, 
HIV in the end is a sexual transmitted disease. So and the sexual transmitted disease goes with other sexual transmitted disease. This is a 21-year-old HIV positive woman with a lower abdominal pain. And here next to the bladder, you can see this area, which was painful and palpation. There is a small fluid collection. This, this was pus. This is a pelvic inflammatory disease. So let's go back into the, into the ward in Schlabisa. And there I want to show you one very interesting patient, 30-year-old HIV-positive patient, CD4 count, very low, um, not yet on ARVs. That's an unfortunately relatively common site with a um, chronic blood, bloody diarrhea. She complains of a week-long history of fat diarrhea. She lost weight, abdominal pain. Stool cultures was taken, but sample lost or results lost. And something is always lost. And so the, there is a wide differential diagnosis. Let's have a look at the ultrasound first. What would you think of? Well, one would think, of course, well, the, the, the general pathogens like Salmonella, Shigella could affect HIV patients as well. Then we have the uh, then we have the amoebic disease, which is not particularly more frequent in HIV patients. But then we have other um, other more opportunistic infections like like TB, like Kaposi sarcoma, and yeah, CMB colitis. A, a wide differential. So when we look in the ultrasound, then we can see here this. You can see this loop, this bowel loop. Then there is here another bowel loop. That is an echogenic, has an echogenic relatively thick wall. See the, the echogenic content, that's the gas, and then surrounded it is, is the bowel wall. Um, another second one I think with a, with a high, higher frequency transducer that shows it a little bit better. See here is a bowel section with a see this the, the, the echogenic is the, the lumen, and then you have more than you know, more than eight to ten millimeters bowel wall. So that's a colitis and that well it doesn't really narrow the differential diagnosis unfortunately because it, it is TB colitis we have the the Kaposi sarcoma the the good thing here was that we got we, basically we, we try, treated the patient first with ciprofloxacin and then consecutively with Bactrim but both of them didn't do anything to her diarrhea and so we finally were able to send her for a colonoscopy which I did at the next um, regional hospital, and we found this typical Kaposi sarcoma lesions, thinking, okay, this is Kaposi sarcoma. So nevertheless, we did a biopsy, and the pathologist called me two weeks later and asked me whether I'm treating this patient. He said yes, and she said, okay, we found Kaposi sarcoma and ca cells which are typical for CMV colitis and schistosomiasis. So I said, oh, well, is that a market? Can I choose? Or basically, this lady had all three of them, so we, we managed to put her on Praziquantel for the schistosomiasis. We, we organized Gancycloir, which took us another two weeks to obtain, but then we gave that for CMV. We put her on ART, because I think that's the, probably the most important um, thing to do. Of course, then we referred her for Kaposi sarcoma treatment to Durban. So that is, of course, a, yeah... A, a rare case, or especially rare because it, it, we, we were able to prove all these pathogens. But in general, it, it shows you that in ages, HIV patients with severe immune suppression, you have to think of, yeah, you always have to think of multiple infections as well. And of course, it shows you, I like this sentence, if you hear hoofbeats, it, you, it's more likely to be a horse than a zebra. That's from the House of God, I think one of the best medical books from the US. But um, if you are in Africa, then hoof beats, then that might not be the case. So it's important always to know where you are and what's your what what what's the local probability. Another interesting case, I think, from a boy that was referred to our TB clinic. He had a swelling 
here and the nerve and this he had also a little bit here but there's even less to see but here's some swelling and the nurse referred him to us because she assumed these were swollen lymph nodes that it would be tb and we should they should be biopsied and we didn't find that a terribly good idea because obviously for a lymph node it is not really the, the, the normal location so we tested him and he was hiv positive and um yeah, the, the the lymph nodes turned out to be the parotype gland. And obviously, when you have your ultrasound machine, you can put your scanner anywhere. Even if you have never scanned a uh, parotype, you always have your own spared so that you can look. So this is my parotype now, because in case not all of you know the ultrasound appearance of parotypes. Here is the bone, then here is this gland glandular tissue, homogeneous, looks like thyroid. And let's have a look at this boy. Gland. As you can see they are bigger. And again, they are these Swiss cheese appearance. Here it is a little bit. There are some cystic lesions. And then the other side, which was even more effective. This is not uncommon. This is not not un it's, it's not also not common. I have to admit, but it is also you, you see it from time to time in HIV patients. This um, this is. The so called DIL syndrome, diffuse inflammatory lymphocyte syndrome. It um, is an, it's an immune dysregulation that, in, that leads to an infiltration of lymphocytes into the parotides. Um, well, this is from the literature 5 to 10% of HIV pa patients seem to have parotide swelling. Mm -hmm. Maybe in, HIV pa in AIDS patients, it's up to 20%. These cystic lymphoepithelial lesions, the salivary gland, um, while well, diagnosis can be made through fine needle aspiration treatment modalities. Okay, this is a bit from the book, simple aspiration. That works, of course, if you have a single, single cyst, you can aspirate a little bit and it relieves the pain. But fortunately, it, it tends to reaccumulate surgical resection and radiotherapy. That sounds a bit out of, the, out of a different world. Um, I think the most um, the most effective treatment is to put these patients on antiretroviral therapy, and most of them um, show regression. Then, so that's that's actually the, the treatment choice, in my opinion. And talking about antiretroviral therapy, this is the the team, the ART team in the clinic, and um, very keen and very um, active nurses and counselors. The ART regimen in South Africa in 2009 was relatively simple. There was a first-line treatment, and there was a second-line treatment, and that's it. And basically, the first-line treatment, which the majority of people was put on, contained D4 T, Stavudine, which is still used in many areas in, in Southern Africa. Not that it, it, is, it is effective, obviously. The only trouble with it is that it has a high number of, of side effects. and um, yeah, yeah. Polyneuropathy to mention. Then the lactic acidosis, particularly in in higher higher um, doses. There are a couple of um, a couple of side effects. And nevertheless, there is one big advantage of the stavudine, and that is it has a very low price. And of course, if you look at the if you look at the sheer number of patients that are treated, this is the curve of from two thousand four to two thousand eight nine. You see, there is an exponential, exponential growth of patients on ART, and then of course, price becomes a, an issue when you when you treat patients. And this is the pharma, the Indian or Indian pharmacist with an assistant standing in front of thousands and thousands of months doses of um, antiretrovirals. So I think that one has to has to understand that systems tend to 
go for the cheaper drugs. Luckily, the stavudine has now slowly faded out because one of the troubles with stavudine was also that it causes these metabolic changes. So typically, the, uh, these um, these fat distribution disturbances. So it tends to cause increase in breast size, often even painful, increased in abdominal fat, decrease in the buttocks. That's a that's frequently complain, and um, also the face um, fat changes. So and obviously when you when you do an ultrasound in these patients, you will frequently see that they have this very echogenic and um, enlarged livers. See that they are very echogenic. You almost you hardly can see the vessels. Yeah. A very bad image. This is always suggestive of, of, of a liver fatty infiltration of the liver when your image is simply you feel like why why am I not able to get a good image? So you see that the the, the liver is so echogenic that it destroys the image. And here now the comparison with the with the kidney, the kidney almost seems hypoechoic in comparison. So that's steatotic liver. That's one of the um, problems associated with the use of, of stubble. Another problem in similar patients, similar, um, you, you can see this, this body shape, very, very similar. Um, also, you can see that the the liver is echogenic, but additionally, you can see that the, the fat here, there is a fat um, collection, basically, in front of the, between liver and abdominal wall, there is this hypoechoic intra-abdominal fat. I remember reading one article, I, mean, I think it was an English English group who's, who measured this and draw conclusions from it. I'm, I'm not sure what kind of conclusions or what's the effect of of um of it i mean it, it it basically it shows you that there is that the drugs you're using have side effects yeah well i think that is something you can um you can know without measuring too much but and and of obviously in these patients with the steatotic livers you want to be aware that that might, they might be prone to lactic acidosis because that's obviously also an, a, a metabolic and a side effect of stavudine use Good. And then with this image back from the beach, I would like to stop this lecture and show you this little clip again from Sudan. This time I want to give the courtesy to my brother. Thank you.